I'll leave it as is. It, it looks fine. Okay. She told me to well, blur this. Well, welcome, people, as, as you start to file in. Um, we're going to wait about a minute or so and let, and let people file into the space, and then we will kick things off officially. Okay, um, excuse me, I'm fiddling with my uh, tablet here. Welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar. My name is Dr. Clint Work. I'm fellow and director of academic affairs at the Korea Economic Institute of America, or KEI. And if I appear a new addition to KEI's programming, it's because I am, I just recently joined. And so I'm very pleased to be moderating my first KEI webinar. Um, for those interested in KEI's programming, our publications, and our upcoming events, please go to KEI's website, which we will put a link to in the YouTube chat box uh, right now. All right. Today's webinar is part of KEI's academic paper series, through which KEI commissions a series of papers each year on a very broad range of topics related to the U.S.-Korea relationship writ large. And today's paper focuses on South Korea as a global vaccine hub, uh, and a PDF version of the paper is available already on our website, which we will also link to in the YouTube chat box. Uh, shortly, I'm going to hand things over to our, uh, our authors to present their research and findings. And after that, we will transition to a Q&A session, um, which I will moderate and maybe use moderator's privilege to pose some of my own questions. Um, but if you do have questions as our authors present their work, feel free to enter them in the YouTube chat box as they do so, and we'll, we'll do our best to queue them up and have them ready to go uh, once they are, they are done with their presentation. And I just want to say before I do introduce our authors, uh, I want to just say how, how much I enjoyed reading their paper. It does a really fantastic job of exploring South Korea's aspiration and national policy to become a global vaccine hub. And it shows how the roots of this policy actually preceded the COVID-19 pandemic, but were given sort of added impetus as a result of it, of course. Uh, they show how South Korea's strategy not only aims to meet the current and future needs of their own population, uh, but also to assist low- and middle-income countries, or LMICs, uh, to, who face even starker obstacles in accessing uh, vaccines uh, to help them do so, uh, not only today, but in the future. So it's a very timely and important uh, piece of research. Our authors, uh, as you can see with their bios online, offer a real diverse range of experiences and expertise on the subject matter. I'm just going to briefly introduce them, and if you are interested in their, their fuller bios, please go to the event webpage, again, on KEI's website. Tom Byrne is president and CEO of the Korea Society. And he was, prior to that, the Asia-Pacific Regional Manager at Moody's Investor Services. And he is also a former Peace Corps volunteer in assignments with the National Tuberculosis Control Program in South Korea. His Korea Society colleague, Claire Callahan, is Communications Officer at the Korea Society, uh, the project manager for this paper, and was also a Fulbright grantee to South Korea, a very uh, prestigious designation. Irene Kyung is a research associate in the Korea program at the Walter H. Shorenstein Asia-Pacific Research Center at Stanford University, and she was previously a policy associate at the Korea Society. I believe once this, when, when this paper started to be written, that was the case. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, Salome is a researcher and analyst in health policy with a background in neuroscience and rare neuromuscular diseases. She completed her master's in public health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health last May with a thesis on COVID-19 vaccination policy in South Korea. So enough out of me. I want to I want to pass things over, I think, to you, Tom, first, and you you all can queue up your your slides and we will we will sit back and enjoy. OK, uh, thanks, Clint. Uh, before we get into the slides, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank KEI uh, for your patience and endurance. This has been a project that's taken many, many weeks to complete. And I, I have to say that um, uh, it's been a pleasure working with uh, our um, the, the co-authors of the paper, and I'm, I'm glad we could um, 
enrich our team from the Korea Society with having uh, Salome from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, uh, Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health uh, join us. So um, I just thought I'd give you some background. Um, the, what started me, what, what, what really put the bee in my bonnet was, wow, South Korea is going to be a global power in vaccines was back in July uh, uh, 2021. Uh, when, when there was still a lot of COVID restrictions in South Korea, but I had a special exemption. I visited Korea and um, there I, uh, I met, uh, I went out to Samsung Biologics and I had an interview with the CEO, John Rim. And Samsung Biologics is uh, located on uh, Songdo Island in Incheon landfill. I'm thinking as I'm looking out at the, uh, the water and the mud flats and all that, this reminds me of POSCO but on the other side of the peninsula on the East Coast. The POSCO was, was established in the 1970s um, under, under Park Chung hee And it, it arose from nothing too, from, from, landfill, uh, from mud flats and became one of, the, uh, one of the leading steel manufacturers globally. And I was thinking, well, one of these days, probably uh, Samsung, maybe SK, SK Bioscience and other uh, biopharma companies in South Korea will be global leaders as well. So that's what really started me thinking. Um, at the Korea Society, this isn't the first uh, endeavor we've taken to, to look at this area. Since the COVID pandemic broke out, um, we've, I've done about, about eight, eight interviews with uh, distinguished uh, leaders and experts um, in the field, uh, starting with COVID lessons from South Korea with uh, Korea's top coronavirus expert, uh, Dr. Kim Woo Chu. I had another one with Kim Woo-ju, um, an interview with the uh, Ministry of Economy and Finance, the, uh, the, the official in charge of the uh, coronavirus pandemic from the ministry's angle. Um, also with um, you know, Celtrion Group Chairman, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, so Jung Jin. Uh, Celtrion uh, produces biosimilars, for those of you who uh, know about all this stuff, you'll know what I'm talking about. And then also with the former Minister of SMEs and Startups, uh, Park Young Sun, we talked about the K-Syringe uh, project. And then I've had two interviews with uh, Dr. Jerome Kim. And I, I know uh, Salome has met Dr. Jerome Kim. So he's the Director General of the uh, International Vaccine Institute located in Seoul, Korea. By the way, I, this is the Korean Economic Institute. The, the IVI is a UN organization. We, we described a little, a little of it in, in the paper, a little of its background, but they were, they were set up in 1997 as the so-called IMF crisis was breaking out in, in Seoul, but they're located on the campus of Seoul National University and they're very busy and doing all sorts of work related to uh, 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 providing vaccines to um, lower and middle income countries. So as you'll see in the paper, we have, um, I mean, a lot of it is descriptive and, and that reflects, uh, I think it reflects the complexity of the subject, the, um, both at the scientific level, the public health level, uh, and the industrial level, the government level, the institutional level, uh, global and national institutions. Um, and so we have 113 footnotes, I think for very, very footnote intensive paper, but we were also trying to not to get, we were trying to, to not lose sight of the forest for the, for the trees. And so we're really trying to take a, uh, uh, a, um, a macro uh, view on what's going on in South Korea. So that's, uh, that's I think, the, the overall framework. It's also an area that um, I think will be evolving quickly in South Korea. Um, however, uh, South Korea currently is having a, a conference right now in Seoul. It's called the, uh, it's with the WHO and um, it's the World Health Bio Summit. And reading some of the, quickly reading some of the, uh, some of the, um, the topics being discussed in, in, in the conference and, and some of the news reports, it seems like the paper's not out of date yet, even though I said it's still evolving. And the topics that we focused on are, are, are uh, prominent topics that, uh, that South Korea is presenting to the world in this uh, so-called bio uh, summit in Seoul. Um, so maybe I can begin with the first slide.
so what what all what what we real what we spend a lot of time talking about in the paper is um, uh, global vaccine manufacturing capacity as well as global vaccine uh, equity. And my basic, I guess, coming from my economics background, my basic take on this is uh, before you can really tackle the issues of vaccine equity, you have to have supply. Supply has to, in the case of vaccines, well exceed demand because if we, you need redundancies and not all the vaccines uh, that are produced are going to be used uh, for various reasons. Um, but at any rate, uh, so that's the approach we're taking. and. Um, Korea is well positioned to add to uh, global vaccine manufacturing capacity. And uh, internationally, Korea is also taking the lead in global training, which will promote both vaccine capacity in lower middle income countries and also uh, uh, vaccine um, equity. Um, to the point number one, we can talk about a little bit more later on. So if I can go to slide number two. So going into the, to the COVID pandemic, of course, there was no uh, vaccine. Um, a lot of, I think, the health authorities were looking to find therapeutics that would work, uh, maybe using repurposing therapeutics or only now developing, only fairly now, fairly recently, only developing new therapeutics. But anyway, one of the one of the great achievements that came out of of the uh, of the pandemic was Operation Warp Speed, and I wanted to uh, uh, just highlight Operation Warp Speed goal because it really was talking about vaccine manufacturing and increasing the supply of vaccines and not so much uh, getting into the other issue, vaccine equity. So uh, this is straight from Operation Warp Speed, a, 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 a fact sheet. And what's the goal? To deliver 300 million doses of a safe, effective vaccine uh, by January uh, 2021 uh, um, as part of a broader strategy to accelerate development manufacturing and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, et cetera. And um, so the, uh, the, the the whole idea is to quickly develop these vaccines because uh, the disease was ravaging the, uh, the U.S. at the time uh, when Operation Warp Speed was established in May 2020. And they wanted to find as quickly as possible uh, vaccines that were safe and effective. Now, I, we contrast Operation Warp Speed success with the and, and speed off the block uh, with the other approach in the EU in the paper where they were really focused on securing supply of vaccine rather than developing new vaccines. You can turn to the next slide. Um, what we um, okay, good. So this shows you the uh, where the initial front runners um, of the vaccine where they were made. Uh, the U.S. was a dominant producer, uh, and U.K. and Europe, including Switzerland, uh, so it's uh, not exactly the EU, uh, uh, including Switzerland, are in there. And you see Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Pfizer, the big, uh, probably the most effect, uh, effective uh, vaccines and safe vaccines that developed, although I, I have to put a qualification for that. I'm not a medical expert, so maybe someone will dispute what I just said, but um, they're among the top, uh, most safe and most effective. I know that, particularly the Pfizer and Moderna. Um, so this is where they came from. And you can see uh, outside of uh, the advanced countries, Europe and UK and, uh, and the US, no country was able to respond as quickly. Um, so it wasn't just the US that had an Operation Warp Speed. Now, we don't talk about this at all in the paper, but I would be remiss not to mention it quickly. And that's the next slide, Claire. Uh, so the UK established a vaccine task force. Actually, it was established one month ahead of the US. And um, it mainly focused, I think, on the uh, Oxford University uh, GlaxoSmithKline uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. And it was established in April uh, 2020. Uh, they also, by the way, uh, had the first uh, use of a vaccine, of an emergency use vaccine, um, used outside of clinical trials in early December. The U.S. followed up in December 14th with a, uh, I believe it was a nurse in Queens, New York, who, who was vaccinated. At any rate, I, I think these three objectives are highly relevant to or seem to coincide with Korea's aspirations, because the first is to secure access to promising COVID-19 uh, 19 vaccines for the U.K. population, for the national population, as quickly as possible. So this would be an objective, I think, of any any national organization or any national uh, vaccine development policy. 
And the second was uh, to make provision for international distribution of vaccines. So maybe the, uh, the, the Brits are a little more globally thinking than the Americans are. But this is also, I think, part of the uh, Korean initiative to become a global vaccine hub, to develop vaccines and distribute internationally as well as use uh, nationally, but also to, uh, to provide the, the training and, and the technical assistance so this is possible in lower and middle income countries. And then also to strengthen the UK's onshoring capacity and capacity uh, capability of vaccine development manufacturing supply chain to provide resilience for future pandemics. And I think this is also uh, aligns uh, very well with Korea's uh, uh, national and global vaccine hub strategy. So the next slide, Claire. Okay, so, um, you know, vaccine, uh, vaccine equity is a, uh, I, I think, um, certainly uh, an endeavor well worth pursuing. It's also a noble endeavor. However, um, Vaccine equity could be a little more complicated than it might seem, and one of the reasons is that um, you know it's 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 hard to get vaccines out to the poorest countries in the world, and by the time uh, I think a lot of vaccines were started to to trickle out there, um, uh, researchers were very surprised to find out that um, the the death rates and the reported case rates were much lower than in in, in the advanced countries in, in many cases. And um, there's reasons hypothesized for that. One of them could be, Af this is the case of Africa, uh, younger population, maybe a lack of testing. So cases are just not reported. Exposure to other infections. Interesting, if you read this uh, this short report, it's so Boston, is it Boston University I, or Boston College? I think it's Boston, uh, BU, Boston University. Uh, got a $3 million grant from the National Institutes of Health to do this research. Why? Why did the case of Malawi, why did Malawi avoid uh, having a, a very serious uh, public health situation, even though they're very, the vaccination rate is very, very low in the single digits in Malawi. So vaccine equity, uh, you can't just say that, you know, to prevent the spread and the, or the, 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 uh, the emergence of variants and through mutation, uh, every population has to be, has to reach herd immunity through vaccination, whatever that is, 70% of the population. I don't know exactly what that number is, but it's more complicated. Um, so I just wanted to put that footnote in there. And the next slide, I believe, is if I turn the screen over to Salome. That's me. Hello. Um, so I'll jump right into it too, for time. Um, and we're, our paper, so as some of you, as Clint has read extensively, but as some of you will read very soon, is about the vaccine hub. And vaccine hub is the perfect buzzword. It means so many things to so many different people. And when we're starting the paper, I had the experience of my thesis of trying to see Korea wanting to get to the status of affecting the vaccine industry globally and also strengthening its own vaccine uh, capabilities. But this word of vaccine hub, was always thrown around and uh, we thought it would be a very important uh, factor in defining it and also differentiating it from the WHO vaccine hub. And so that's what I'll try to do short uh, in sh short terms today. Um, uh, next slide, sorry. I tried to do the slides, but I don't have control. Uh, so the first thing I will dichotomize here is global vaccine hub is a very different concept uh, than WHO hub. Um, so it's really important to separate that in, in, in your mind. Uh, and first I'll define global vaccine hub. So as you see on the screen, both in, uh, academia, academic papers, and just press, uh, a vaccine hub has been used to mean a vaccine leader, whether that's a company or a country, but also a large vaccination center where people go and get their shots. Is it all of the above? Is it only one? And so for the sake of our paper, what we had to do is go back to what is vaccination? What is the vaccination process? Mm -hmm. And what we ended up in terms of definition, um, ended up with in, in terms of definition is a global vaccine hub is a country that can achieve every step of the vaccination process and also help other countries um, towards achieving those steps themselves. And so now you will ask, well, what's the vaccination process? And so next slide, please. I apologize to the immunologists in the audience. This is a very simplified graph of 
the vaccination process from creating a vaccine to making the vaccine, so biomanufacturing to distribution. So research and development, uh, essentially trying to figure out the pathogen, so the, the, the protein or the organism that is infected people and making them sick. Um, so creating the vaccine, and then we will need to make the vaccine in a way that is safe and efficient and is transportable so that it can get it to people. So that's MPT, manufacturing, packaging, and transport. And then a vaccine is not going to work if it's not in people. Uh, so the, there is a lot of intelligent and funding required for distribution and monitoring. Um, and so a country that is a global vaccine hub will have well-funded pre-crisis sec sectors, both in, in uh, government, both in um, just uh, private research um, in each of these three categories and continue to pursue advancement in each of these three categories. Um, and then be able to help other countries while they they um, develop their sectors as well. And so this is this is what definition we uh, used to address the paper. Now, uh, in terms of WHO hub, that's a different story. If you could go to the next slide. A WHO hub, as we define in summer 22, uh, which we realize is this was changing around and because the hubs are so recent, the first hub in South Africa opened in 2021. So it's barely a year old and it's still, the, the public information being released is, um, it's there, but it's slow coming and uh, it's still, you know, trying to figure itself out or maybe it's been figured out, but just not uh, publicly discussed in detail. And so what we have from uh, the papers and documents that are public is this definition, which is a, a WHO vaccine hub is a consortium of scientific, national, nonprofit bodies coordinated by the WHO, so World Health Organization, which aims to spread knowledge relating to the vaccination process. And that's a lot of words. So I'm I try to draw a picture so that it's a little clearer. It's I know it's a it's it's a new concept. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So this is a South African hub. So the hub in South Africa opened in 2021. And so far, uh, as of this this graph was made in August 2022, I believe it is still current. Uh, there have been some additions along the way, but the hub concept here is meant to you to represent the hub and spoke model. So the hub is a center. And here we have South Africa being designated by the WHO and South Africa selecting um, a body inside the country. So Afrogen Biologics, which is an industry partner. And this industry partner is home to the, to the hub. So in this case, this is an mRNA vaccine technology hub. Um, that means it's a hub dedicated to understanding mRNA vaccine technology and distributing knowledge to others and other countries about mRNA vaccine technology, how to make it, how to um, create a vaccine from mRNA technology, um, and all those things. So Afrogem is the, the host institution for this. And that is that organ that post is supported by the WHO, by COVAX, by Medicines Patent Pool, by the South African Medical Research Council. Um, and as is coming out, uh, is it is also supported by different research organizations in the US as well as Belgium recently. Um, and so this hub, the center of the hub, is disseminated knowledge to spoke countries. So there, there have been thus far two spoke countries, Brazil and Argentina. Um, where a group of scientists from those countries are sent to South Africa, where they learn the technology and how to build infrastructure to accommodate for this new technology, and then go home to build this infrastructure and create um, and use mRNA vaccine technology um, on their own. And so you can see on the left of the screen, those are upcoming uh, spoke countries who will receive um, this technology in the future that have been announced thus far. For the South Korean hub, if you can go to the other slide, please. It's a little bit of a different format, uh, but it's still relying on this center, which is South Korea, disseminating knowledge to other countries, uh, principally LMICs, where here, South Korea is the global biomanufacturing training hub. So that means it is the hub is focused on education related to biomanufacturing, how to make vaccines. They've been principally focused on vaccines at the moment because 
of COVID-19 uh, because of building capacity for COVID vaccine specifically. But the name also indicates maybe it will be for other therapeutics, for other um, medical devices and things and, and those things on how to produce them in the future. That is only speculation. Uh, but thus far, the courses have been on vaccine and how to produce them, how to manufacture them. And so IVI, has, as we mentioned earlier, as some was mentioning earlier, was nominated by the Ministry of Health and Welfare in early 2022 to be the center of this hub and to accommodate for the trainings thus far have been and the third one starts Halloween day, so next Monday. Uh, and they have been a few weeks long. So it's usually two to three weeks. The next one will be three weeks long. And participants are, as opposed to the South African hub, not from one specific country and set in, but instead they are participants selected from different LMIC countries who apply to participate. And they're all sent together. Uh, so it's a diverse group of scientists sent to the hub to learn the basics of vaccine technology, bi vaccine biomanufacturing, sorry. Um, thus far, it has been just the basics of uh, biomanufacturing vaccines. This may change in the future, but thus far it has been the format. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that it seems like the WHO hubs are still building themselves up both in terms of capacity and um, get, getting support in terms of science scientists communities and different scientific communities engaging with those hubs. But what do we expect for this future of the WHO hubs is that more hubs arise. So as I mentioned in the graph that has three parts, the vaccination process, you can see there's a lot of things that need to happen for a vaccine to be produced. And so it seems from the South African and South Korean hub, that each hub will be for a specific part of the vaccination process and therefore to en uh, encapsulate an, a complete education on the vaccination process, there will need to be other hubs open. Um, so we expect new hubs to arise. We also expect longer training sessions. Um, learning how to manufacture a vaccine can take years and it takes practice and so the courses that are currently offered specifically in the south korean hub are only a few weeks long um which is a great introduction but it is to be expected as as these trainings um become um more advanced with more participants not only will they be longer for more time for practice but also on the third point here you can see it can go beyond the basics as new technologies come about um in biomanufacturing, in mRNA vaccine technology, the courses could be not only longer, but on different kinds of different parts of this particular technology, different advancements of this particular technology to, in the end, make a WHO hub ecosystem where participants could enter the South African hub and then be sent to the South Korea hub to learn another part and then go home with the knowledge of how to build infrastructure for vaccination in their country and go from there. Um, and so in the end, the grand vision perhaps is a more in sync, a more globalized scientific community so that when a crisis does happen, not only countries on their own can produce vaccinations and start research and have the infrastructure for that research, mm -hmm. therefore not relying on other countries like happened during COVID, um, but also ideas and new formats and new science can, uh, can happen faster and with different perspective and with new perspective from uh, countries that have historically not had uh, that infrastructure. Um, that is what we know thus far. And uh, it is very exciting to see where WHO hubs will take us. Hi everyone, um, I'm Irene and I'll be talking about South Korea's own domestic vaccine hub strategy. A little disclaimer, my Wi-Fi is um, going in and out, so if I happen to cut off, um, my apologies in advance. And I please. So I'll start with the original ambitions and um, the current uh, domestic landscape in South Korea that um, has fostered this um, vaccine capability. Um, so the original ambition for uh, domestic vaccine capability in South Korea have been around the H1N1 influenza so pandemic in 2009-2010 where South Korea had a difficult time securing uh, US-made vaccines for its own population and therefore had to turn to collaborating with private and nonprofit organizations to improve vaccine production. And since then, we've seen various efforts pop up 
um, including the 2016 Vaccine Zero to No Project and the 2020 Vaccine Innovative Technology Alliance Korea, Vital Korea um, initiatives, um, which were to achieve vaccine sovereignty for South Korea. And on the domestic um, political front, we see leadership support. Um, we see political heads announce their support in fostering South Korea's vaccine hub development and growth. So in August 2021, uh, former South Korean President Moon announced that um, now South Korea's intention to become a global vaccine hub for COVID-19 and other vaccines. And then um, this past July, uh, current South Korean President Yoon about to make the biohealth industry into a key national strategic industry. Um, so up front, we already see um, two leaders um, across the political aisle uh, announce their support for uh, South Korea's vaccine health capabilities. But also we see uh, various committees um, formed in, within the South Korean government. So um, the um, South Korea's Global Vaccine Hub Office is a committee under the South Korean Health Ministry. And this one uh, works to coordinate ongoing collaborations between South Korea and other organizations such as the WHO and um, other countries such as the US. Um, and on top of this political interest and support for South Korea's vaccine health strategy, uh, South Korea already has existing uh, research and development biotech uh, manufacturing capabilities. So they're not starting from scratch this whole vaccine hub idea. Uh, most notably, um, South Korea has developed its first homegrown vaccine. I'll get a little bit more on this later. Um, there are existing public health agencies, such as the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, which has been lauded uh, for its original pandemic response um, in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there are also plans to expand manufacturing plants in South Korea. So, uh, for example, SK Bioscience will expand its Andong plant to um, produce mRNA vaccines, and Tom has also um, indicated through his travels um, that there are other plans to do so in Korea. Um, and lastly, financial support and investments in South Korea um, are plenty. Um, they're still growing um, uh, to support the vaccine um, hub initiatives. Um, so in March 2020, um, the South Korean National Assembly passed a supplementary budget of around 10, million, uh, 10 billion sorry, dollars, um, of which 3.2 billion uh, were allocated to the Ministry of Health and Welfare to aid in the pandemic response. And additional public um, financial support has been announced uh, for the Global Vaccine Hub. And I'll get more on that um, in just a bit. So next slide, please, Chris. So focusing a little bit more on South Korea's domestic vaccine uh, research and development and also manufacturing uh, capabilities. So as I mentioned, um, SkyCovion is one of, is, is the first um, vaccine developed by SK Bioscience and um, jointly with the Institute for Protein Design at the University of Washington. Um, this is the first um, COVID-19 homegrown vaccine um, in South Korea. And in June, 2022, um, they received recommendation for approval from the Ministry of Food um, and Drug Safety in South Korea. And just this past September, uh, SK Bioscience submitted the emergency use listing um, application to the WHO for further global use of this um, vaccine. And so the South Korean government um, will buy 10 million doses worth 200 billion one um, for domestic use first. And in terms of vaccine production and manufacturing, so um, we all know Moderna is a biotech company pioneering in mRNA therapeutics and vaccines. Um, and they entered into a fill finish manufacturing contract with uh, Ensbio in 2021 to produce COVID vaccines um, in Samsung's um, Tongdo production facilities. And this vaccine was eventually um, approved and distributed within Korea and exported to other countries such as Colombia and the Philippines in um, the latter part of 2021. Um, next slide, please, Claire. And so with these efforts, we can see that South Korea's domestic landscape is well prepped to take on a global vaccine hub initiative. So Salome um, mentioned the Korea World Health Organization um, training program to um, that will be um, or has arrived in Korea and will continue to um, facilitate trainings for lower and middle income country uh, nationals um, in developing and manufacturing biologics. Um, so not only limited to just vaccines, but also insulin production and also uh, cancer treatments. Um, the second is the Korea Asian Development Bank um, initiative. And this one's very similar to the WHO one um, with the caveat that 
it trains nationals from um, countries that are um, members of the Asian Development Bank, and uh, they receive training on the entire vaccine manufacturing process, um, which is operated by the Korean National Institute for Bioprocessing Research and Training. This institute also opened manufacturing uh, training and research center in Chun, uh by 2024. And there's financial support to aid in these efforts, of course. Um, so domestic and foreign companies have been identified to partake in investments, uh, research and development uh, for these initiatives, um, adopting a global vaccine hub model. So eight corporations have been identified um, to aid in this initiative, uh, five of which are Korean. And the foreign companies specializing in uh, manufacturing are investing over $350 million as well. Um, in terms of the public support, the South Korean government under President Yoon uh, will provide $1.8 billion to help finance investments related to the K Global Vaccine Hub Strategy, and it's also uh, $420 million for the Global Bio Training Hub between 2022 and 2026. So all across the board, uh, we see that South Korea itself is well positioned to become a global vaccine hub, uh, given the domestic infrastructure um, as well as the public and private support um, for these initiatives. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Claire to discuss global efforts in vaccine production. Thank you so much. I mean, yes, as she just said, um, my brief section is on global vaccine production and on vaccine diplomacy. Uh, so as we've discussed, uh, you know, South Korea's efforts to become a vaccine hub, I wanted to put it in the context of the global vaccine system um, during COVID-19 and provide a few highlights from the uh, major players, so to speak, uh, and their government's response in vaccine development and production. Uh, so first, we will start off with the United States, um, which historically has led uh, global vaccine development. Uh, with vaccine giants like Novavax, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson being based in the U.S. Um, the U.S. vaccine production of new mRNA vaccines, um, as we discussed uh, in the introduction, was helped uh, by Operation Warp Speed, uh, which supported a private and public partnership and enabled the government to expedite vaccine trials and development uh, to deliver safe and highly effective vaccines in a matter of months instead of years. Uh, next, we have the EU and the EU vaccine strategy, uh, in which member states acted as a unitary group uh, to uh, procure vaccines through uh, countries with pharmaceutical companies and distribute them to each nation based off its population size. Uh, in contrast to Operation Warp Speed, uh, the EU focused more on the purchase rather than the production vac of vaccines, um, which did eventually impact the vaccine rollout process um, due to uh, pharmaceutical companies' uh, inability to scale up production when needed. Uh, next is India, um, which is colloquially known as the pharmacy of the world, and for good reason. Uh, it's home to the Serum Institute of India, uh, among other companies. Um, Serum Institute of India is the world's largest vaccine manufacturers by number of doses produced and sold globally, uh, with about more than 1.5 billion doses. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the Serum Institute of India partnered in collaborations with Oxford and AstraZeneca, as well as Russia's Gamaleya Research Institute um, to produce the Sputnik vaccine. Uh, China is the world's largest supplier of COVID-19 vaccines, producing uh, over or around 2 billion doses, uh, which is in line with China's push to become a major player in global public health. Uh, currently, China's pharmaceutical market is second largest in the world behind that of the United States. Uh, unless we have Russia, um, Russia has high ambitions uh, to maximize its global impact uh, for its Sputnik vaccine. Um, with initial aims to produce enough to vaccinate out of one out of every 10 people on earth. Uh, the country has run into supply chain issues, um, as well as the effects of sanctions uh, from its invasion of Ukraine on these efforts. So what can we take from this? Basically that the vaccine production process is distributed unevenly um, in the hands of you know, just a few countries. Uh, so with that in mind, um, I'd like to take a look at global vaccine approvals uh, in chart one. So as you can see, um, as of September of this year, 41 vaccines have been developed and approved by at least one national regulatory body. 11 of these vaccines have been approved uh, for emergency use by the WHO. 
with Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, as the top three most widely approved. I should note that these three were produced in multinational partnerships between, uh, between wealthy Western nations. The next vaccines with the most approvals uh, mirror the major players that we just discussed um, and were manufactured by Serum Institute of India, Moderna, which is US-based, uh, Gamalea, which is Russian, uh, Sinopharm, which is China-based, Novavax, which is US-based, and Sinovac, which again is based in China. Um, and of these vaccines, uh, one was produced in Korea, which was the Sky Covion vaccine that we just discussed, uh, which they do a plan, uh, plan to apply to COVAX. Um, so COVAX, as discussed earlier, is an effort of um, vaccine diplomacy, basically, uh, through multilateral partnerships. Um, some countries have approached COVID-19 vaccine diplomacy on a multilateral basis. Um, using this initiative to distribute vaccines um, as demonstrated in this chart. Um, the US has been the largest contributor to COVAX, um, shipping over 650 million COVID-19 uh, vaccines globally as of October 19th, um, as part of its pledge to donate 1.2 billion doses in total. Uh, in contrast, uh, China, the world's largest supplier of COVID-19 vaccines, um, has conducted its vaccine diplomacy bilaterally um, outside the COVAX system. As you can see, it's uh, not listed here. Uh, Chinese vaccines have received uh, fewer regulatory approvals than Pfizer, uh, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson as displayed here. And then moving specifically to South Korean vaccine diplomacy, uh, multilaterally, uh, Korea is a minor contributor to COVAX, but also has other notable efforts, which I will expand upon now. Um, in terms of bilateral vaccine diplomacy, uh, the CORES Global Vaccine Partnership was announced in 2021 between President Moon Jae-in, former president, and President Biden, as I already discussed. Um, this was intended to speed up the production and global supply of COVID-19 vaccines in times of global vaccine shortages, as was the case in COVID-19. Um, this was expanded on this year um, at a joint press conference with now President Yoon and President Biden uh, with the announcement of the Global Health Security Coordinating Office in Seoul. Um, lastly, South Korea has uh, offered uh, COVID-19 vaccine aid to North Korea, uh, which has not been uh, receptive to these overtures. Um, North Korea has uh, allegedly begun uh, vaccinating its population through the use of Chinese COVID uh, vaccines, uh, making it one of the last countries on earth to begin its COVID-19 vaccination program. Okay, so, and now we will hear back from Tom on the conclusion of the uh, presentation and explanation of the paper. Over to you, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Claire. Um, let me get this video back on. Okay, good. Uh, well, um, no matter how many times I've read this paper, listening to uh, uh, Salome, Irene, and also Claire, I, I always tend to learn learn more of a bit, bit, and it comes into focus a bit bit more clearly. So, in conclusion, I only have one slide here, right, Claire? You can turn to it. Um, yeah. So the conclusion is that uh, the Lancet Commission just came out. This was led by uh, Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University, and um, <clears throat> And they concluded that, uh, it, was, it was pretty obvious, I think, that COVID-19 pandemic revealed a massive global institutional failure at multiple levels, okay? And so how do we overcome this? Um, well, one way is to develop global hubs, uh, either a global vaccine hub, as Salome uh, mentioned, or the WHO hub, which I think could perhaps help speed up uh, the localization of vaccine production. And Korea plays, a, uh, I think, a good role here. It, can, it has uh, immense manufacturing capacity in just about any industry. It's ramping it up in the vaccine industry. It also is developing depth in scientific research and, and development, as, as I think Salome uh, or Irene mentioned. Um, it has uh, uh, strong institutions, public health institutions. So it can conduct those three pillars that, that define a uh, a global vaccine hub. Um, and um, as an as, uh, as a, a side a side note here, uh, for those of you who follow trade, there was a big issue in the, with the w, WTO to, uh, to uh, a movement to get the trade-related intellectual uh, property 
uh, waivers for patents and the, w, the WTO, is moving, WTO is moving forward on that. I think what's critical is that whatever happens, this is unfolding, it's taking two years for the WTO to get this, to get this moving forward, um, is to um, ensure that the incentives for producing vaccine, the incentives for biotech companies, pharmaceutical companies, whether they're in the advanced countries, including Korea, let's include Korea in there too, uh, that these incentives to produce new vaccines to take on risk uh, is, is still there and to get rewarded for taking on risk. Um, so the, the future outlook, just bringing it back to Korea, as I think all of us have, have touched on, is that um, uh, Korea has a laudable track record in developing world-class uh, industries. Uh, South Korea's uh, vaccine industry will likely develop along similar lines. I think combining its manufacturing prowess with innovative technology of its pharmaceutical firms, while also tapping into the, um, the innovativeness and the technology available in advanced countries. And um, I think there is certainly a need uh, in the world to build uh, uh, stronger resilience and um, to future pandemics. And this can be done by, uh, Korea could play a significant role here developing its global hubs. So Clint, I'll turn it over to you. I think there's a good point that you raised about it is heavily descriptive um, because I think that you as authors were grappling with the fact that your you were sort of laying um, the, the context, the lay of the land for a still ever developing ecosystem, um, and it was developing as of course as you were writing the paper. Um, but I don't think it will. I think it will continue to have shelf life because it's a great reference point, even as this ecosystem continues to evolve, to look back at and to see how how it has and where it's come from. Um, so I think it's a, a great contribution. Um, and thinking a little bit about things moving forward, um, I wanted to pose the first question. I do see we have one from the audience, and and if you do have any other questions in the audience, please pose them now. I will get to them. But I want to pose the first question, and that is. As the world gradually does move uh, out of the COVID-19 pandemic and it becomes a, a less urgent issue, is it possible that South Korea's global vaccine hub strategy uh, could sort of stall? And are there any indications um, that this might already be happen happening or is the UN administration uh, just as committed to maintaining this national strategic policy? Uh, Clint, I'll jump in first. Salome, I'm interested to hear your opinion on this as well. Um, so I think that the, the shock has been so great to a lot of countries that um, we probably won't be caught as flat-footed as we were um, uh, as the pandemic rolled out of uh, rolled out of China. Um, so the way the way I look at this is that uh, you know there's, there's the the national institutions probably have to be reformed and strengthened. Uh, I mean, institutions on a public health systems on a national level, that's a front line. So the initial response has to come nationally or even at the subnational level. But then since pandemics are global, uh, there has to be, this has to be complemented with, with, a, with a stronger international system. And that's why in the conclusion of the paper, I, I bring up the, uh, the Jeffrey Sachs um, uh, Lance Committee enumerating 10 failures, including multiple shortcomings, not only when the South, but more broadly with a lack of multilateral and coordinated approach by governments to manage IP rights, technology transfer, international financing, um, vaccine access and production in hmm. uh, lower and middle income countries. So a lot has to be done, but I think we've all learned that um, if we just think about it, this was really an existential threat that we we, we faced. Other things are going on in the world where we are claimed to be existential threats, but um, you know, 6.9 million people uh, as of the first two and a half years of the pandemic um, were recorded as having died from the pandemic. Probably the Institute for Health and Metrics Evaluation at the University of Washington thinks it's much higher. Maybe more than 17 million people have died. So if there's not an urgent reason to strengthen your institutions, I can't think of a better one. 
And I, I think the Koreans have learned from this. You know, Korea learned from the Middle East respiratory syndrome experience. At first, they had uh, less than a death response, but they learned very quickly and they applied it to the uh, K testing, K quarantine, and K control for the um, uh, um, for the uh, SARS two pandemic. So I, I think the shock has been so great that, um, um, and the loss is so great that mm. this will stay in our institutional memory. Mm. Um, Salome, what are, what are your, what, how do you see this evolving? Um, I, I was wanting to give a chance to Claire and Irene uh, first if uh, they had thoughts. Okay, I'll go ahead then. Um, I, can, I can go uh, right after. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of has it made an impact and is it, are things happening for this to be a long-term change? Yes. In, in terms of the uh, investment that we're seeing in um, the, both the private industry side and just public funding for labs and for research to continue toward this expansion of scientific achievement in Korea, uh, that is definitely happening. Um, and to go back to what Tom just said, I think the, the challenge in a way will be the institutional change. It is still happening and it has happened in great part. However, um, Korea's response in terms of primary prevention of the spread of the virus has been praised worldwide. And that is something that, that Korea was one of the countries that did that best. It is, however, not to say that there were no issues in both this initial prevention and hiccups and also vaccine distribution, uh, where a lot of bioethical questions came about, where the um, stories of vaccine passports, which we won't go into, that's a whole other you know ethical conundrum. and. Uh, where, you know, the access to masks uh, for people who are not on the national insurance at the start of the pandemic, that was also a big issue. There were these pockets of um, more related to the third part of the vaccination process, so distribution and monitoring, that were there, but there were still gaps. And I think to achieve the, the full global vaccine hub status, these investments in scientific progress and how to manufacture better, they're essential. But there is also this, um, as Tom mentioned, institutional redistributing that needs to happen. Um, just having studied public health for a while, sadly, you know, pandemics, however great they are, they're remembered, but that memory can be short. So my only hope is that we make sure to hang on to that memory. It looks like we will hang on to that memory and the systems will change. Um, but not only Korea can do this, this is also a global question that we need to address uh, as WHO members um, and just a world. Irene, you want to chime in here? Yes. Um, yes. So uh, regarding their uh, original question about um, the less urgency of the COVID-19 pandemic and the effect on uh, the vaccine hub strategy, um, can you hear me? Yes. My okay, great. Um, so I I would say um, the vaccine hub strategy isn't focused solely on COVID-19. Um, so the WHO vaccine um, hub initiative with South Korea is also focused on um, producing other types of medical um, assistance, so like insulin production, also cancer treatments, as well as other um, vaccines for um, non-COVID related um, illnesses. So. Uh, even with the lessening um, urgent issue of COVID-19, I think there's still work that can be done um, in maintaining these uh, vaccine um, hub initiatives in South Korea. And also, I would say the team at SK Bioscience is trying to um, have SkyCovid on approved at the WHO would say no. But the field then they um, would probably very much for global use as well. Um, so uh, I don't see any um, issues in like slowing down the uh, vaccine hub strategy in Korea as of now. Hmm. Um. <laughs> I'd also uh, just like to chime in if that's possible. Yeah, Sorry, an issue of having four people <laughs> in co-authorship. Um, I think, you know, Tom mentioned at the beginning of the introduction as well, but the fact that you did this week, 
South Korea with the WHO is hosting the World Bio Summit. And now President Yoon uh, already made a speech um, and how at this bio summit there is, um, it's likely that there's going to be a, a declaration known as the Seoul Declaration, which calls for you know a lot of things in terms of international pandemic preparedness, you know, cooperation in tracking viruses, um, you know, enhancing R and D, um, and just a general distribution to be more equitable on um, vaccines and treatments and diagnostic tools. So I think taken together, all of these efforts demonstrate that um, South Korea is going to continue to put its ambitions um, towards this, you know, now and, and, and quite in the future. Um, so there is there is a there are two questions that have come up from the audience, and one of them I think. Irene and Claire both sort of just answered, but I will just throw it out there to see if there's any additional mm -hmm. response to this. And the question is, based on these initiatives due to the COVID-19 pandemic, do you expect South Korea to work more towards pandemic preparedness, readiness for future issues or continue to focus on SARS, COVID-2 variants? I think it's, you know, just briefly, I think it's definitely future oriented. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very, you know, South Korea and the the uh, development that it's put around this initiative um, has been future focused, you know, not just looking at COVID, but they know that, you know, future pandemics, you know, in this, you know, global uh, world are, are much more likely. And I think that's in part, you know, factoring in um, on its bet to become a hub, um, you know, filling the need and filling the gap uh, to address, you um, you know, not just COVID and not just, you know, previous um, diseases and pandemics, but uh, to be at the forefront and not, um, and try to eliminate some of the problems that were made apparent in COVID. So that, that would be my answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll, I'll, in the interest of time and getting to all of our audience questions, I'll turn to the next one, which I, I do find a little interesting. Um, and this is directed to anyone who would like to answer it. Uh, to what extent could the Korean companies and or government tout new vaccines, insulin, or technology as part of medical tourism as yet another product to sell to customers abroad? So this the commercial side of this. Uh, whoever has this question, that's amazing. Um, I feel like Tom has a lot to say about this. I also have some stuff to say. Maybe Tom, sorry. I, 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 just, I would be remiss if I didn't say we have three minutes left, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Tom. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, a lot of countries are competing for medical tourism or developing medical tourism. In fact, a couple of years ago, as an aside, North Korea was looking into developing medical tourism, that big hospital they're building in Pyongyang. I don't know how that's working out. Probably not too well. Um, I um, I mean, I have some very general thoughts. It's, it's treatments are probably easier for medical tourism than uh, and, and the treatments that you could derive the therapeutics or the vaccines or whatever the technologies from elsewhere. So um, I think South Korea is at the point, I kind of look at it, it's similar to the semiconductor industry, whereas 30 years ago, uh, by far the majority of uh, manufacturing capacity in vaccine and uh, semiconductors is done in the US and, and Europe. And now the uh, US is down to like 19%. Europe and the US are way, way at the bottom. And it's all in Asia now. It's it's Japan, Korea, Taiwan, of course. Um, so maybe this will take time to develop where Korea can develop its the depth and capacity to manufacture devices and equipment and all that stuff. Um, I don't know exactly if I directly answered the question. Maybe you can, uh, Salome. Yeah, and with a minute to spare, uh, I will try my best. So medical tourism is something I've also been really interested in because I have first encountered the concept, uh, maybe as a privileged French person with universal healthcare uh, in, in Korea, where people would come uh, to be medical tourists and get treatment in South Korea. Um, will it be, you know, will these <clears throat> innovations be on the map? I mean, we see, we will see more traffic from international scientists, obviously through WHO hubs, through perhaps uh, increased investors coming into Korea focusing on health. So I think it also depends on what you define by medical tourism. Um, but uh, touching on, you know, it, it also will come to a discussion of yeah, what that encompasses, 
what how Korean traditional medicine is placed in that because during the COVID pandemic there were also discussions of what Korean medical doctors should be doing or are doing or what they're allowed to do um so overall a very interesting question I think the answer is somewhat yes in the sense that there will be more attention directed to science in Korea I mean there already is but they will there will continue to be in the future well thank you I there's as is always the case uh you know more questions than there is time to address. Um, but I want to thank all four authors again for a, a really timely contribution and also remind our audience that we will, the paper's already posted on KEI's website, and we will also be posting this discussion in, their, in the author's presentation uh, as well um, uh, in, in relatively short order. Uh, so again, if you're interested in KEI's programs, uh, go to our website. There'll be plenty coming. And one more time, thank you, uh, Tom, Claire, Irene, and, and Salome for a fantastic piece of research. Well, thank you, Clint, and thanks to the Korean Economic Institute for giving us the opportunity to delve into this area. And thanks to my co-authors for uh, working on this together. Thank you, everyone.